This country was wiped off the map for over 100 years, and yet it became the center of some of the greatest mathematical activity of the entire 20th century. How? This notebook. On August 15, 1939, three Polish mathematicians gathered together in a small cafe where they discussed the likelihood of an imminent world war. The conversation centered around one of their deepest concerns, protecting the Scottish book, in case their city was bombarded. Mazur suggested burying the notebook in a secret hiding place that only the three of them would know about. They agreed on a football field just outside the city. Two weeks later, Hitler invaded. Mazur went into hiding, and Bonnach survived the war by becoming a lice feeder. Ulam would go to the United States and eventually be invited to work on the Manhattan Project, where he provided key calculations in the development of the hydrogen bomb. All three of these men contributed to the Scottish book, but its primary creator was Stefan Bonnach, Poland's greatest mathematician. His name appears in countless theorems. He invented an entirely new area of math that was pivotal for quantum physics. And with Alfred Tarski, he proved math's weirdest paradox, a paradox that challenges some of our most deeply held assumptions. So what is the Scottish book? And why do these mathematicians think it's so important that it should be secretly hidden throughout the war? It is a notebook filled with 193 of the most challenging problems written and solved by some of the greatest mathematical minds. It became a symbol for a golden age of mathematics in Poland, started a long-standing tradition of collaborative problem solving that continues to this day, and provides a unique glimpse into the charming personal side of what's often viewed as cold, abstract mathematical research. To truly understand its significance, we must consider the culture from which it originated. Poland's contributions to mathematics has quite an unlikely history. You see, from 1795 to 1918, Poland had no independent existence and was split between Germany, Russia, and Austria. During this time, Polish people living in these lands focused their efforts on preserving their language and culture primarily through literature and poetry. The culture that endured throughout this trying period was so united, however, that 19th century Poland has been described as a nation without a country. Though some mathematics was developed, it was all written in Polish and consequently not accessible to the outside world. So while German and French mathematics thrived throughout this century, Polish mathematics was comparatively non-existent. But in 1918, as the first world war was coming to an end, all of that was about to change thanks to one man's vision. Zygmunt Januszewski was a man born and raised in Warsaw. Eventually, he moved to Paris to do his PhD work in topology. He was supervised by none other than Henri Lebesgue, the inventor of measure theory. In 1918, World War I came to an end and Poland regained its independence. As one of the few prominent Polish mathematicians at the time, Januszewski published an influential paper where he outlined a blueprint for how math should develop in this newly reunited country. His vision was simple yet profound. Given its lack of mathematical traditions at the time, Januszewski proposed that Poland focus all of its efforts on training mathematicians in only three fields, logic, set theory, and measure theory. His plan was wholeheartedly embraced. And soon after, he created the first ever Specialized Math Journal, a journal that attracted papers from all over the world in various languages and established a strong connection between Polish mathematicians and the rest of the global math community. It was in this environment, inspired by Januszewski, that Poland's greatest mathematician and primary creator of the Scottish book emerged. Bonach's contributions to math are impressive, but the story of his life is almost unbelievable. Born in mystery, Stefan Bonnock's mother abandoned him when he was just four days old. Soon after, he was abandoned by his father as well, left to be raised by his grandmother and eventually a loving foster family. Even as an adult, Bonnock tried to find his mother's identity, but his father refused to reveal it, saying that he was sworn to secrecy. 
In high school, Bonnock developed a close friendship with a young man named Vitol Vilkos, and the two shared a deep love for mathematics. Soon after graduating, however, they both decided that there was nothing new to discover in math. So at university, Bonach enrolled in engineering, while Vilkos studied Eastern languages. During his engineering studies, Bonach still maintained a love for math, and at some point began learning Henri Lebeg's measure theory. Unknown to him, this casual decision would have enormous ramifications for his future career. Around this same time, a Polish mathematician named Hugo Steinhaus was struggling to solve a problem that was heavily reliant on measure theory. It was known to him that for a given function in one space, a certain set of partial sums converges to the function. In other words, the limit of this integral is zero. But he wanted to know if the same thing happens after you change the space and use a different notion of length, which would require removing the square here and seeing if this limit also goes to zero. Steinhaus struggled with this for some time until one day he took a casual walk in a park. He overheard two young men discussing measure theory and quickly introduced himself. The two men were Stefan Bonach and Otto Nikodim. After speaking for just a short time, Steinhaus soon recognized Bonach's genius. So he told him about the problem he had been stuck on. Just days later, the young Bonach would solve it. He discovered a counterexample and proved that the limit does not converge. He then wrote up the solution with Steinhaus and published his first ever mathematical paper. Reflecting on this chance encounter with the young Bonach, Steinhaus would later in life say that he considered it to be his greatest mathematical discovery. Bonach was clearly a natural genius, but in order to get good at math, you don't have to be. All you need is hard work, discipline, and Brilliant. If you haven't heard of it before, Brilliant is an incredible online hub of courses related to math, physics, and even computer science. Here, you can learn tons of interesting math, develop intuition, and train your problem solving skills all at the same time. What's more, you can do it on any computer or mobile device. Something I've really enjoyed lately is going through their course on logic. It's not just dry definitions and truth tables like you'd see in many textbooks. With Brilliant, refining your reasoning abilities can be done in the best possible way, through play. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash abide by reason. Scan the QR code on screen or click on the link in the description. Brilliant's also given my viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. Bonach's career had an unusual start, and the rest of his story gets even weirder. Steinhaus took him under his wing and gave him the chance to become a research mathematician. The two eventually moved and worked together at a university in the city of Lwów, Poland. Bonach thrived here. Despite having no formal math degree, he was hired as a professor under the condition that he would defend a PhD thesis in just under one year. After six months, however, he had so many new results that he was tricked into doing his defense early. Completely unknown to Bonach, someone compiled all his results into a dissertation. Then some professors casually asked him to come into a room to answer questions they had. He answered them all thoroughly without having any clue that the entire meeting was arranged as his PhD thesis defense. And this thesis, unsurprisingly, was brilliant. As just one small part of it, he invented an entirely new mathematical space that leads to geometries where spheres can become cubes and circles can become squares. If you're curious how that works, you can check out my video on Bonach spaces below. An interesting quirk about Bonach is that he couldn't stand working in silence or alone. He preferred noisy places and collaborations. As Ulam would once write, whether in a university office or in a cafe, you could sit with Bonach for hours discussing a mathematical problem. He drank coffee and smoked cigarettes almost constantly. Bonach's favorite place to work was a coffee shop down the road from the university, the Scottish Cafe. A cafe which, just like the book, has absolutely nothing to do with Scotland. It got its name due to its uncanny resemblance to a Scottish castle. 
It was here that he did most of his work, and the Scottish book originated. What started as infrequent trips on rare occasions with some of his colleagues quickly turned into daily visits and essentially an entire mathematical society with its own unique culture. It was a culture so highly regarded that one professor said to be invited to the Scottish cafe was tantamount to being knighted. Banach, Ulam, Mazur, and Steinhaus made up the core of this society. They would gather for hours on end to discuss problems they were working on. Marble tabletops allowed them to easily write and erase thoughts that came and went. According to Steinhaus, one session lasted 17 hours and resulted in the successful proof of an important postulate concerning Bonnach spaces. No permanent record of it was made, however, and no one since has been able to reproduce it because it was probably completely erased from the tabletop by the cleaners. Unfortunately, many other proofs derived by Bonnach and his students suffered the same fate. Quickly, they realized that they needed a better system to track their progress. So Bonnach went to a shop to purchase a notebook, and the Scottish book was born. This notebook was safely guarded by one of the waiters, and only taken out when requested by a mathematician who wanted to contribute a new problem or write down a solution to one already in it. In total, 193 problems were written and included in the Scottish book. The problems were based on various topics ranging from set theory and group theory to measure theory and functional analysis. A number of them also had eccentric prizes attached to them. Of course, the most common was whiskey, beer, or wine. But there was also a live goose, a kilo of bacon, and a week-long visit to Copenhagen. The problems were written by Banach, Steinhaus, Mazur, Ulam, and more than 20 other contributors including even a few unexpected cafe visitors. Some were solved quickly, others took many years, and some remain unsolved to this day. The problem that promised a live goose as a prize was created by Stan Mazur in 1936. A problem closely related to a famous problem about Bonnach spaces, it was solved 37 years later by Per Enflo. True to his word, Mazur presented Enflo with a live goose in Warsaw, Poland, during a ceremony that was broadcast throughout the country. Completely unforeseen by those who contributed to the Scottish book, what began as a simple notebook turned into something much greater. The Scottish book has been described as 20th century's greatest mathematical relic, and it truly deserves that name. In a country that didn't exist for 123 years, an extraordinary surge of mathematical brilliance occurred over the span of just 23 years. There were other great Polish mathematicians at the time, but the group that contributed to the Scottish book is rightly viewed as Poland's greatest mathematical school, with Banach as its leader. In fact, this book had such a profound influence on others that its tradition has inspired other similar notebooks, including one in modern day Lviv, Ukraine. Today, there is a new Lviv Scottish book that current mathematicians still contribute problems to. One of its more recent problems asked whether a particularly tricky series converges or not. It was also posted on Math Overflow and then unexpectedly answered by none other than Terence Tao. In keeping with tradition, he was awarded a bottle of mead as his prize. Another unique quality of the original Scottish book is that not only does it provide a glimpse into the incredible mathematical culture in which it was created, it even yields insight into broader historical events. The book suddenly stops at problem 193, which was written by Hugo Steinhaus on May 31st, 1941. Tragically, the great math school that Banach worked so hard to create was almost instantly destroyed. Certain estimates say that Poland lost around 50% of its mathematicians in the war. Some were fortunate enough to have fled to other countries like Ulam, but many were tragically murdered. It's unclear if Ulam, Banach, and Mazur ever actually buried the Scottish book, but thanks to their foresight, it would somehow survive the war as it passed from Banach to his wife and then his son. After the war, his son would give it to Steinhaus. 
who then sent it to the United States to Ulam. Eventually, Ulam would translate it and make it accessible to the English-speaking world. With its still unsolved problems and a portrayal of a charming personal side of math, the Scottish book continues to inspire. It's a powerful symbol showcasing the strength of mathematical resilience and the importance of shining the light of reason in even the darkest of times.